That's a lot of damage. How about a little more? Not long ago in my video about Girl Defined, I briefly featured a clip of a British Muslim woman talking about an Islamic view of women's rights. A lot of you commented on just how ridiculous and dangerous you found her ideas to be, but I don't think you got to see just how ridiculous things really get in that video. So, I thought we'd take a look at the entire thing and take on each of her claims from her ideas about the hijab to her discouragement of freedom for women. One of the biggest myths that has been propagated about the hijab is that Muslim women have been forced into wearing it by our male relatives, whether it's our husbands or our fathers. I remember distinctly an elderly Englishman asking me if my husband had forced me to wear mine, which I was really happy about because it gave me the opportunity to explain the truth to him. But sadly, most people won't actually ask us. And I find it quite patronising that the majority of people around us, the media and politicians, all find it acceptable to speak on behalf of us Muslim women without asking us for our views in the first place. If this is the popular idea of how women are forced to wear the hijab, I'm definitely not propagating it. I think many women are forced to wear the hijab, but I don't think it's just men that are forcing them. I think it's Islamic society as a whole. In many places where it's not legally enforced, it's culturally enforced. Women must wear it or else risk serious social consequences like damage to or even loss of important relationships. Even beyond that, women can be indoctrinated in such a way that they feel tremendous guilt if they don't wear the hijab. Also, I can empathize about media or politicians not asking Muslim women their opinions. I get the desire to have your voice heard, and I think you should legally have the same opportunity to speak on the issue as anyone else. However, for those that share my ideas about how women are forced to wear the hijab, I understand why those opinions aren't sought. Women can be forced to wear it, but just say they aren't. Given social or psychological enforcement, we actually expect women to say that they aren't forced to wear it. And that's why Muslim women's opinions on the issue just aren't authoritative. The reality is, this myth is at complete odds with the evidence. I mean, if the hijab was a symbol of women's state of subordinance, then how do we explain the fact that the highest group of converts to Islam, both in the UK and the US, are women, where many of these women wear the hijab without having any male relatives to force them into it. First, allow me to reiterate that I don't think women wearing the hijab is contingent upon male relatives. Those who are forced to wear it face pressures far beyond that. Secondly, women are typically more religious than men in the first place, so I'd expect a majority of converts to most religions to be women. Also, the UK and the US have Muslims who are liberal enough not to see the hijab as mandatory. Are Western women converting to a brand of Islam which is indifferent about the hijab? We don't know whether the hijab is a deterrent to conversion or not. I won't make the claim either way, but it seems that she will, and without sufficient evidence. And if the hijab was an issue to the majority of Muslim women, then how do we explain the results of the 2005 Gallup survey, where Muslim women in eight countries, including Egypt and Pakistan, were asked to describe what they resented most about the societies they live in, and the majority in each country stated political and economic corruption as being their greatest concerns, whilst the hijab, the so-called tool of subjugation, was not mentioned once. My ideas about the hijab's enforcement are still unaffected here. If many women were essentially indoctrinated into wearing the hijab and kept that way via social and psychological pressure, we wouldn't expect them to say they resent it. Plus, even if some women surveyed were willing to say the hijab is oppressive, I'm pretty sure the political and economic corruption in countries like Egypt and Pakistan are bad enough that they warrant the highest levels of resentment even for those women. I think we have to question this assumption that if a decision made is based upon freedom of choice for the woman, then somehow this alone is when she is valued and elevated. Because if we look at what freedom has created for women in society, we find that actually the opposite is true. Secular liberal societies where people are free to determine for themselves how to view and treat women have made women's lives a misery. Yeah, she's uh, really done herself a disservice here. This claim is not only ridiculous, but also demonstrably false. We can measure whether people in secular liberal societies are more miserable than those in Islamic countries. And, you know, I don't think the results of those measurements are really going to surprise most people. According to the World Happiness Report, the happiest countries in the world tend to be secular liberal countries where women's freedom is legally allowed and culturally embraced. Meanwhile, countries which are primarily Islamic in law or culture where women's freedom isn't prized 
tend to be much less happy. Now, this report doesn't measure women exclusively and doesn't give us much detail about the causes of reported happiness, but I think it's safe to say that women's freedom does not make women's lives a misery. From eating disorders to the rampant levels of sexual harassment, rape and domestic violence, where according to Home Office statistics, an incident of domestic violence is reported to the police every minute here in the UK. Is this really the value and elevation that women seek? She says this like these issues don't exist in Islamic countries or that they're worse in secular liberal societies. That's so far from the truth that it's not even funny. According to the World Health Organization, when it comes to violence against women from an intimate partner, regions with more secular liberal societies tend to be the best, and regions with more Islamic societies tend to be some of the worst. The World Health Organization has also identified some factors that likely contribute to violence against women. The variation in the prevalence of violence seen within and between communities, countries, and regions highlights that violence is not inevitable. There is growing evidence about what factors explain the global variation documented. This also includes the importance of challenging social norms that support male authority and control over women and sanction or condone violence against women, reducing levels of childhood exposure to violence, reforming discriminatory family law, strengthening women's economic and legal rights, and eliminating gender inequalities in access to formal wage employment and secondary education. Bringing up these issues only seems to backfire when you're trying to defend a restrictive Islamic system. And finally, as for eating disorders, those are more widespread in wealthier secular liberal countries, but research indicates that this is likely due to body preferences across cultures, not modesty. Alternatively, for the Muslim woman, there is no concept of freedom to dress as we please, but instead we perform all of our actions out of obedience to the Creator, seeking His subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure alone. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nur verse 51, the saying of the faithful believers when they are called to Allah and His Messenger to judge between them is only that they say we hear and we obey and such are the successful. And so the Muslim woman wears the hijab out of complete submission to the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala and unapologetically. So, yeah, she confirms my ideas about the hijab. She proudly admits, for the Muslim woman, there is no freedom to dress as we please. So, ultimately, her response to the question, are Muslim women forced to wear the hijab, is yes, not by men, but by Islam, and that's the way it should be. Though hijab is a law that seeks to hide women's beauty, in a society where the very liberal values of freedom have created the viewpoint of a woman as being a sexual exploit, where her beauty is everyone's business, the hijab cannot ensure women are protected nor honoured. And the levels of sexual harassment in countries like Egypt, where many women cover, testify to this fact. The bottom line is, a piece of fabric alone can do little to change the predominant viewpoint of the woman, which is what leads to her exploitation in the first place. Instead, Hijab has to exist as part of an entire system where all laws and values are in harmony with it. Her whole narrative about hijab not protecting women in secular liberal countries really falls apart when we know that even when all laws are in harmony with hijab, as in Islamic countries, there's still more abuse toward women there than in secular liberal countries. Also, I find her use of Egypt as an example here very interesting because it indicates that she thinks Egypt isn't conservative enough of a country. It also shows that she's not just advocating cultural enforcement of Islamic principles, which much of Egypt has, but full legal enforcement. Also, if we're set on the idea that women being seen as objects is the cause of their abuse and exploitation, then given the data on this abuse, we should actually conclude that Islamic areas objectify women more than secular liberal ones. Her argument just backfires once again. If we're actually being realistic, though, the way women are treated isn't determined solely by religious influences in an area. I'd guess that standards of living like wealth, social stability, and health care also play a huge part, with religious and cultural values playing a role as well. Hijab, when implemented as part of the entire system of Islam, seeks to create a society where women are honoured and treated with respect. Through the Islamic education system, the correct Islamic thoughts are built in all citizens. There's no concept of freedom to view people how you wish, but instead Islam prohibits the exploitation of anyone and builds the correct viewpoint of the woman as being an honour to be valued for her character and her intellect over her physical appearance. Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, the world and all things in it are precious, but the most precious thing is a virtuous woman.
Okay, I'm going to try to break down what I think she's getting at, explain a little about Islam, and show just how her ideas fundamentally differ from Western ideas. In secular liberal societies, this advocacy toward restricting freedom seems absurd and even extreme, but this is a common Islamic view. Restricting freedom is a common complaint many Western people have about Islam. Some Muslims try to deny this view of Islam, but many explain that certain freedoms are in fact purposely restricted. However, they say this is acceptable because men and women are given different rights and freedoms. For example, men have the right to choose their careers and to dress more comfortably, but they must work. Women don't have the freedom to choose their careers or dress, but they do have the right to some of their husband's income even without working. There's also a different idea of personal value for many Muslims. Many see valuing women as treating them as a prize to be protected from harm or corruption and to be provided for, much like how many conservative Westerners see their daughters. Meanwhile, the secular, liberal idea of valuing a person is prizing and protecting their individuality, allowing them the freedom to do what they choose. These values reflect differing ideas about how to maximize well-being for women. The difference comes down to the classic political dilemma of security versus freedom. Luckily, on this issue, research tells us which approach better promotes well-being. So if we're not just committed to an ideology above all, we know which approach to support. The ends which Islam achieves don't justify its means. Now this viewpoint is further ensured in society by taking the woman's sexual element out of society and restricting it to her personal and private life through societal laws such as dress code, but also segregation and the prohibition of any jobs, roles or actions in society which exploit women, such as modelling or pornography. And so hijab, along with all the laws and values of Islam, came to regulate the relationships between men and women, ensuring a productive cooperation between them in public life, and thus enabling women to actively participate in all fields, from politics to the workplace, or even just at home or whilst out shopping, all free from harm and harassment, unlike the levels of abuse we see facing women in the West. However, this result can only be achieved when implemented as the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, implemented as an entire system, the Khilafah system. As we've already seen, this system does not in fact ensure women's safety in society. The data is clear, there's really no argument there. Controlling these factors in this way does not ensure women's well-being in society and even seems to have the opposite effect. What I wonder, though, is whether she, or any Muslim for that matter, actually believe in and follow certain commands of Islam like this one for the societal benefits they offer. If those benefits were proven to be false, as they really have been here, would Muslims actually stop following those commands of Islam? I highly doubt it. I'd bet that submission comes before the supposed benefits of Islam. If those benefits were non-existent, most Muslims would still believe the Islamic way of life to be best, to be the right way to live. The idea is packed right into the whole seeking God's pleasure alone thing, after all. In the case of the Muslims this applies to, valuing and seeking well-being is not the reason for belief in this Islamic system. I say this because in many arguments between Muslims and non-Muslims, both sides act like adherence to Islam is based on valuing well-being, when adherence really isn't. Debates over these social systems are important, but if we're actually seeking to cut to why Muslims believe in Islam, these debates are often just red herrings. Even if non-Muslims definitively win this specific debate, even if Muslims see how badly this video's arguments backfire, many Muslims' ideas won't change because they don't actually base their beliefs on it. If you want to change minds on a deeper level, here's a tip. Kindly ask your interlocutor if the evidence or arguments you're presenting here were non-existent or defeated, would you still believe what you're defending? If they say yes, there is a deeper reason why they believe what they do. So ask that question until they say, no, I would no longer believe it. When they say that, you've found the reason to discuss if you want to change their mind. Every one of your interlocutor's arguments can backfire, but pointing that out will never change their mind if they don't base their beliefs on those arguments in the first place. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. Shout out to Anthony Magnabosco and the whole street epistemology community for teaching me the questioning technique I mentioned here. I highly recommend you check out the video link in the description if you want to learn more about that. As always, praise be unto Adam, my top patron and personal lord and savior for making this video possible. Go ahead and subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic, join my Discord, and until next time, stay skeptical.